as a clinician, right, there are two ways to do um, therapy. There's a, a directive and non-directive approach. Mm -hmm. Directive means, I'm going to give an example. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is a very directive approach where I come in with a set agenda, or we create an agenda together, and we hit those points on the agenda. I go over it, I teach you a technique, mm -hmm. we process, I do a summary, you go home, right? Yeah. There's still some you talking about what's on your heart because we create the agenda in that process in the beginning. What would you like to discuss? We stick mm -hmm. to the agenda. I give you the techniques. You go forth and be great. Then you have a non-directive approach, which is more like person-centered approach, where you come in and I go, okay, so how has your week been? What's been on your heart? What would you like to discuss? And it kind of free flows from there, right? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to lay that down as the foundation. So the reason why mindfulness is very, very important as a clinician or being present in the moment is this. When you're present in the moment, yeah. you get to get that information, whether it's directive or non-directive. Both theories, whether you're directed or non-directive, requires you to kind of get out of your boat mm -hmm. and get into their water and wade through their water with them, their experiences with them. It's real difficult to wade through the water with them when you're constantly getting triggered mm -hmm. and you're thinking about, man, when they said that, it made me think of this. It made me think of that. Is that me? Am I that? Now you done stopped wading in the water and they're mm -hmm. 10 yards, 20 yards ahead of you. Yeah. Now you're snapping too, like, okay, what did I miss? So therefore, it's important to be present because they need you in that moment mm -hmm. while they're wading through the water to point out the things that they may not be picking up, whether it's a direct approach or a non-direct or indirect approach. That's why it's important for you to be present. You're doing a great job. I just want to let you know. Hey, I appreciate yeah, that. No, Thank no you. problem. No problem. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> but it, that, that part is it's important because <clears throat> people often think that therapists don't have issues. They do. Most people who look at the Marvel I know you got skedaddle, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most people who look at the Marvel movies are uh -huh. gonna instinctually think that Tony Stark is the smartest man in the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. He's not. Yeah. He's not even in the top three. Yeah, it's he advertisement. might be number five for yeah. all I know. But he does a lot yeah. with that number five spot. He does. Yeah. If you look at the movies, you're going to think that he's number one. The mm -hmm. two smartest people. Actually, the, the list is updated now. But uh, for years, it was Reed Richards, Dr. Doom. Hank Pym was number three. Mm -hmm. Hank Pym is number three, but I, I won't get into that. But what I'm saying is this. The reason why the maker is the Reed Richards of an alternate universe because mm -hmm. Marvel was trying to send a statement that if Reed Richard became unhinged, mm -hmm. no one is safe. Yeah. It's, it's, it was to denote, like, the brilliance of Reed Richard. That's why mm -hmm. I, I would... So for, for movie purposes, it would be better to make Tony Stark the maker, as I say that out loud, because they do the cosmetics. He's, yeah, they he's do established the as that. It would do, yeah. it would do, it would generate more revenue we get, because we get unhinged him actually. Right. Yeah. It would it would really it would shock your it, the, be the average movie person. It's right. okay to say it's enjoyable. So for me as someone who grew up yeah. reading comics, yeah. when you saw an unhinged Reed Richards, you was mm -hmm. like, this man is really a problem. Because we yeah. we know what an unhinged Doctor Doom looks like, because mm -hmm. that's Doctor. That's who I'm waiting on. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge Doctor Doom fan. Yeah. You can't tell me nothing about that guy. There's two people. <laughs> so here's here's my top five. Not like top five, but my personal favorite top five. You don't have to do this yeah, on no, camera. I'm you be, don't. I'm be real. It's quick. all right, man. I, I mean, you can edit this out. You can edit no, this. I'm gonna keep it, but you don't have so to do this. Here's my top five. Just real Marvel. Quick. Yeah. Oh no, I, just in Marvel. This is just Marvel. Okay. But anyway, hey, welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Monday. Here with my boy Doctor B. What's up, Doctor B? How you doing, Juice? I'm Thanks good. I'm good. No, anytime, man. Anytime. Thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. It's been, you. A, it's so been a very gracious convo about yeah. the Marvel pieces it out has, there. The it yeah, I'm probably going to take that beginning to the end because we really <laughs> been down the road. But um, you know, um, what's it like being a black male therapist who owns their own practice? Humbling. And a, and a doctor. Got to yeah. put that part in there, too. It is. I know people, a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. I say it's humbling because I became the person that I envisioned I would be when I was in high school. Oh, that's a tall glass. It is. Yeah. Hey, when I was in high school, I knew I was going to do mental health. Mm -hmm. And I ended up becoming that person. Mm -hmm. And it's only by the grace of God. That's why it's so humbling to okay. me. Okay. Because when I say it's humbling, it's kind of like you... Everybody has a dream of who they want to grow up to be, and I actually became it. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it kind of puts you in a place of, like, it was only by faith that I got here. 
Okay. It was. So okay. therefore, I can't even take all the credit. So That's you like, you're the person walking across the beach and Jesus, like, walking next to you, like, step by step, you know, that, Man, that in those faith called footprints in the yeah, sand. Yeah, That's yeah, the yeah, 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 now, yeah. I'm the part of the story where he carries you. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. I ain't gonna lie. There's parts where he had you to drag me You being from D.C. Too. and mm-hmm. saying someone carried you? That's, hey, hey, no, nah, man. That's the um, only mm. person that can carry me is Christ. Okay, okay. see, that's real. That's I'm real. glad you, yeah. The, the only, that, when yeah. you put it in that context, yeah. the only person that can carry me <laughs> is Christ. That's it. I can do all things. Yeah, I can, yeah I, the, the buck stops right there. It's just Christ. <laughs> but that the humbling part was, um, mm-hmm. let me not just keep saying the humbling part. It's a beautiful experience, and I'm truly appreciative of it because it was in the journey Mm -hmm. that I started to enjoy the process of growth. Okay, okay. I think my journey was the same um, coming here from my far off land. Actually, that piece behind you, the Mm -hmm. green piece with the word juice on it. That's actually a piece from home. One of my homies in high school did it and it glows in the dark. And that was like. I just kept carrying art with me for like years and years, collecting art, never putting it on the wall. Because I was always afraid, hey, if you put it on the wall and it gets damaged, how would you feel? So Mm. instead of putting the gifts on the wall out for it to be displayed, I was hiding them. They were just collecting dust. And dust eats away at art. I didn't know that. Yeah, dust eats away at art. So anytime you see like old uh, pictures of art or anything like that and it's covered in dust, you usually find everything gets damaged. So technically, art is destroyed by humans because dust is just collections of skin Skin over time which Mm -hmm. is really filthy this one's imani this one is from one of my boys who i worked on u street with for about a decade this is from an artist for don't mute dc Mm -hmm. the third don't mute dc protest when they had it wasn't a riot there was like a wave that went with the crowd because somebody was getting jumped for talking smack to someone else's girl. Mm. (laughs) As you can see, the corner of this art is broken. And that's why I purchased it because he was like, nah, fuck this, it's over. I said, hey, how much you want for it? He was like, what do you mean? I was like, how much you want for it? He was like, I do it for 90. I said, I bet. So this is an incomplete work, but like sometimes when you buy things, it's very important that the time something is made and what it represents is almost as important as the art itself. Mm. And these pictures are actually from my boy who I do work with intimately with Get Home Safe from the beginning from Don't Mute DC. This photo, that photo behind you up there, this photo behind you on the right. Um, yeah, no, nah, it's different works of art. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really big on... Juice, where are you from? Jersey. I figured as much. Yeah, I remember you telling me you had moved into the area. Mm-hmm. What got you so interested in the culture behind our city? Um, so I've always grown up in the hood, and when I wasn't in the hood, I was hood adjacent, mm-hmm. and that was always to be opposite of my parents. So my parents are very much Jamaican on both sides, cops, um, and I always felt. It's weird when I hear black people say we got to move up and out to like suburban places and where resources are better. I I understand it, but it's just like you came from the hood. Correct. I agree with that. You were raised in the hood. There's value in the hood. I don't even consider the hood the hood, but it's just an identifier of where you're from and what might be happening there. Correct. Like not everyone in the hood grows up with a gun or grows up getting jumped. At all, yeah. Sometimes it's just a rougher area or lack of resources, but the hood isn't bad. The hood just needs more, just needs to be taken care of. And I would never want to make the mistake of now that I'm moving on up, I've forgotten where I've come from or what that feels like or what I've learned there just because I'm doing better. No, I agree with you. I agree with the notion of I don't think that too many, I think that black people need to gentrify their own neighborhoods mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. clearly white people see the value of where we come from yeah you know i mean? I'll put the light above you also by the way just for you have a better quality shot okay. in the video so just be aware of that you got a great lean though like you sat perfectly i saw when you got aware i was like oh no nah, he's he's done something like this before i wish it could go higher but i didn't want the balance to be too off so I got you, I got let you. me know though if you want me to move it up for it to be more comfortable no no for I'll, you. I'll be okay i, I know yeah. it's there it's not hidden anything so it's fine yeah, nah, but I, I do wish that more black people took value you in your own neighborhood because white people even just modern day times gentrification Mm -hmm. isn't really a a new thing if you look at the histories of the inter uh the interactions among races 
You start white, with redlining? Not even redlining. I'm talking on a global that. scale. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, Europe always has an interest in Africa. Mm -hmm. They see more value in that continent than potentially even Africans themselves. But doesn't it start with making Africans think that place isn't valuable? Exactly. Yeah. That's why I say, like, I wish that black people, even mm -hmm. just globally, believe that they were of value yeah okay. because at the end of the day mm -hmm. in order for you to sell out your own people right mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just talking like bad politicians both yeah. on the continent and here in the states right we have so many black politicians that will pander for black votes but won't do nothing for black people mm -hmm. black people globally globally have bought into the notion that black is subpar or yeah. black is deviant yeah so i use that as an example to say that even down to the hood, like if you, if black people would tend to their own hoods, mm -hmm. their neighborhoods, take mm -hmm. value in them, they would see the growth from them. That's why gentrification is such a, a booming business for so people, so certain groups of people, because they come in and buy the property at a uh, cheap price, mm -hmm. move all the black people out, mm -hmm. build it up, and then black people are like, man, the neighborhoods changed. It mm -hmm. did, but the New same York's resources that you that took, right now. you yeah. said what? New York's a great example. Yeah, of that the right same now. the same thing you were saying earlier when you took your resources mm -hmm. and moved to the suburbs, they came in bought their resources. Yeah, almost the same resources, not quite the same, but almost, and built up your neighborhood mm -hmm. and turned a profit. Imagine if you did the same thing yourself. Mm -hmm. But doing it yourself is kind harder. of the first mistake, though. It is harder, but it's the first mistake mm -hmm. to do it by yourself. So. Being from Jersey, when I was here, I went to Catholic University of America. I actually got my degree right behind this light. Okay. So I've always had like works of art in my hands for like a decade, and I didn't start putting them on the wall what until I met her. Uh, sociology. That's what's up. Yeah. If so, you like mental health so much, I didn't mean to cut you out. Why, mm -hmm. why didn't you just go get a mental health degree? Uh, mental health developed. It wasn't my first option or start. My past partner actually is the reason I got interested in mental health because I grew up in a hospital. Mm -hmm. My parents, well, my mom worked in a hospital and she was like, hey, you want to become a doctor? That's something you're interested in. Become a patient advocate for the summertime. So all throughout high school for like the four years I was there, I was a patient advocate every summer. So being a patient advocate, I was dealing with like HIV patients. Mm. I was dealing with like any patient complaint. That was when being a patient advocate was like a real job and not that the hospital is using this position to look like they're doing everything they can, even though they're not. So that was before yeah. what it's now become. Because like anytime I see the word advocacy and stuff, I usually think. And this goes for mental health and the work I do now. Are you really an advocate mm. or is it just a word to cover up liabilities for jobs to make sure that they get a measure of people mentally and who they're going to have to get rid of years down the road? Mm. That's why it's hard to like trust corporations and what they have going on internally, because like the people we're seeing getting fired and let go. This isn't something new. This is something that was planned. That was like always in the back of the mind. But the pandemic really just sped everything up with the use of technology. Mm -hmm. So like that's where we are now. So when it comes to mental health, uh, her name was Nisha data from like 2012 until she passed away in 2018 she struggled with mental health stuff between depression and anxiety from like 2007 2008 until present and there were like moments where she was bullied by like her own friendship so i saw what mental health look like in terms of how it deteriorate someone i saw what mental health look like when someone is doing everything they can outside of getting therapy, I saw what mental health look like on the breakdown side. And I, I also saw what mental health looks like when someone finally has an opportunity to build themselves up and they are they have the right environment in terms of people around them, support, acceptance, and people that are willing to cater to them and their needs. And I also saw what mental health looks like when the world betrays you. And things start to fall apart and the expectation of what you've rebuilt isn't meeting the reality of what actually is going on and how bad that can be. And that's why this exists as a platform. Gotcha. I like your definition because I wish more people had that definition because when people talk about mental health, mm -hmm. they always immediately jump to disorder or illness. And yeah. I'm always like, your mental health is so much broader than that. It's, it's a not, measure of. Exactly. Yeah. It's not the disorder. I always explain it to people this way. It's that. It's your ability to navigate different spaces authentic to yourself. Mm -hmm. So meaning that 
I mean, I'm always going to be, well, now I'm Dr. Brown, so I don't really yeah. got to worry about, like, going into anybody's office and, like, code switching anymore because mm-hmm. I don't work for anybody else. Yeah. But even in that regard, for those people who have to, being able to navigate that space and fully recognizing the experience for what it is, mm-hmm. I'm code switching Yeah. for survival, to not get fired, mm-hmm. it's stressful. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, the environment's stressful, but for you, if you have an accurate appraisal of that experience, yeah. that encompasses your mental health. That is your mental health. Like, mm-hmm. knowing why you do, how you be in every environment mm-hmm. is a is my easier way of explaining mental health to people. And then also explaining where you may have to find elasticity mm-hmm. because like not everyone's check is the same Correct. i don't expect my managers to understand what mental health is just because it's a hot topic right now but i do expect my family members that have known me for 10 to 15 years to at least know what the hell i've been talking about whether they want to listen or not they should be be able to at least recognize stuff's hitting the fan and i need you and if i don't need you or you don't have a capacity to have my back in the way that's fit for what I need, I may need to turn to someone else who's not you. You know, I agree with that. That was yeah. a good way of putting it because the elasticity part, mm-hmm. I would loop under that umbrella because if you know, so recognizing stress, anxiety, and depression is a useful skill in and of itself, but then it goes into how do I navigate it. Mm-hmm. That's where, to what you're saying, and to yeah. what I'm going to add on to it is the elasticity comes in. Like, how do you navigate it? Support systems is one good way. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you're a good support system for me in this moment, but maybe not in this one. Yeah. Or do I have the tools and techniques on my own? People really do underestimate how interactions with other people affect them. Yeah. Like, they really <laughs> underestimate. A lot of times, America will have you thinking that the most successful human being, or actualized, as we say in therapy, is an autonomous human being. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. Stupid. Yeah. It's yeah, not. you're a computer. You're yeah, a exa- robot. Exactly. You know, like, you don't you don't have re- any other ports or people that you're plugging into. Exactly. Yeah. The reason why therapists and psychologists try to get rid of solitary <clears throat> confinement in, in prisons is mm-hmm. 21 days in isolation, you'll develop schizotypical features, okay. which is 21 days. Mm-hmm. You could potentially develop auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, which is 21 days of isolation. And then when you get out, you don't have the resources or the money to or the funds to take care of that. Mm-hmm. Because no one wants to hire a convict. Correct. Yeah. So it's and even then, like for instance, you see these play out mm-hmm. in the public with homeless people. Yeah. They're in the community, but they are isolated. That's why people see them walking, talking to themselves. A lot of times, people think that they might be tweaking off of fentanyl or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they're having a psychotic break mm-hmm. because they're so isolated. Yeah. They're in the public, but they're not engaging with nobody. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's people need people mm-hmm. there's just no way around it but learning how to navigate people when they're people in mm-hmm. that that's elasticity as yeah. i would call it you gotta then, learn that no nah, no nah. and then like you know trying to approach that person because now they need someone to talk to they're on page 58 and you coming on page one they're not yeah. trying to oh, backtrack because yeah. they're already trying to pick up the pieces and put it together because mm-hmm. conversation when someone is talking to themselves it's proof that you do need to communicate with yourself mm-hmm. Like, I um, I ran this business by myself. Originally, I had a team behind me, and now it's just me. But there's nothing wrong with that. We've all made amends with how things are playing out. But I think it's very important to have people check you on when you're wrong and people let you know, hey, what are you doing or what you're not doing? And think to yourself, hey, do you have the ability to do that? Oh, yeah. Like, um, one of my boys, uh, Trey. You haven't met him yet. He was one of the folks that I wish would have pulled up to the joint, but he does work out in VA. I told him about the event that we did, and I was like, look, I'm about to be interviewing a whole bunch of therapists who are doctors. I was like, the um, the goalpost is moving <laughs> in terms of who I have access to. But I was like, you know, to me, I only see you guys as people that are doing work, but the world sees folks with master's degrees, folks with doctorates, and that's nice, but like the work still starts with the people who originally mm-hmm. wanted to do the work. So it's like, it's unfortunate that no matter how high you move up on the ladder, you still have to wear different hats in order for people to mm-hmm. be willing to understand, all right, maybe I should be more open to accepting this change that's coming my way. Oh, yeah, I agree with that assessment because <clears throat> you do have to have people willing to stop you and check you. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, 
I, I would never want to be around a group of yes men. It would no. irritate me. It's like, how yeah. do I, now I have no real accurate appraisal mm -hmm. of if we're moving towards our goals or not. Mm -hmm. Because my goal may shift with my mood. Mm -hmm. I might think X is a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to have somebody on your team to go, we don't do X. Well, that's the Drake effect we're seeing right now. Did you say the Drake effect? That's the Drake effect right now. Describe it. When you get so big that it's very hard to hear a no from anyone in your oh. team because you've been surrounded by so many yeses. Yeah. So when you're a star and when you're that big, like, you know, outside of all the allegations and everything that have come out from the beef, Wayne's not beside him anymore. That's Nicki true. Nicki Minaj, you know, held him down for like the first 24-hour period when everything happened. But then distance herself. And when you look at Kendrick, it's still people who are still at eye level. Mm -hmm. Schoolboy Q is still there. TDE is still there. You could do videos. All the Compton's coming out. Right. Prior relationships. And it's like, you know, as much as Toronto, Even Day Free. The main yeah. person that Drake was like, Day Free sleeps with your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. His baby mother. Like, all these allegations. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah, right. Yeah, Kendrick's yeah. unit was still intact. Mm -hmm. And it's like, he's showing the room full of people. And they're not there because the video was there. They happen to already be there, and now they just brought cameras in. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like, even down to um, Kendrick's wife doing a crip walk in the wife beater. Because yep. mm -hmm. we know what that stands yeah. for. And it's like, I, right. when you see that, and it's like, you know, not to talk about the beef, but, like, we have a lot of examples of what Yes Men looks like right now. Biden, the yes. campaign that's going on, a lot of Yes Men. If he, did, if he had more people that were saying no, more people that were realistic, that he respected... He would have dropped out of the race two months ago yeah. for Kamala to take over and be like, all right, what can we really do as a campaign with everything that's coming up? I'm, I'm not going to break up any other examples. I feel like those two are good oh, right hey, now. Those are good right now. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get started with this conversation. You're, you're genius, man. I could have this conversation going on for a long time. All right. Tell the folks who you are and what it is that you Oh, do. we're already live. Yeah, now we've been live. I did not know that. Well, once you put that on, it's I yeah, that's, that's why I was like, nah, once we were in there, like, when the you red go light back is and, in. Yeah. When you go back and look at this, uh -huh. I was looking at this trying to check my positioning. So I don't want you to think that I was being conceited. <laughs> looking I can at cut the this camera. out. You're fine. You're good. Oh, no, yeah, I, yeah. They won't, they won't never hear about this one part right here. I'm not opposed to that. I'm fine. Yeah. With, I, I can stand on everything. That works I wouldn't say anything uh -huh. on camera that I wouldn't say, say off, off camera. camera. No, I saying. might change the. I might change the approach because, yeah. aside from, I don't want future clients and current clients mm -hmm. to ever be influenced by my perspective too much. Okay. Like for instance, this is conversation we always have. Like I don't think dating outside your race makes you less black. That, so when I don't you say we, do you mean the community of black community people of or black the family? People. No, okay. the community of black people. Okay. Like People will come to me all the time and they go, Dr. B, you think dating outside your race makes you less black? I say, mm -hmm. no, your actions will make you less black. But yeah. I will say that dating outside of your race makes me question how far you're willing to go mm -hmm. when it's time to fight for black people. Mm -hmm. That's the part where I'm like, I need to see that because how do I say this with love and care? Take it off. I got you. <laughs> I mean, okay, Malcolm X in the, in, the, in the Nation of Islam often refer to them as white devils. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be on camera mm -hmm. in front of someone like yourself, yeah. white devil, white devil, white devil. Mm -hmm. But then you got to go home to one. You're mm -hmm. not going to have that same energy yeah. at their family reunion, mm -hmm. Christmas gathering. Yeah. And not to mention when you choose a partner, you're going to integrate some parts of their worldview into your self-identity. Yeah. It's just unavoidable. Yeah. So that's where I'm kind of like, that's where I go. How far are you willing to go in this struggle? Mm -hmm. Because your identity is black, it's going to be psychologically antithetical to her or his or their, however they identify themselves, identity of being white. Mm -hmm. Because you have two what um, Dr. Amos Wilson calls survival thrusts going forward. Like yeah. for instance, your wall is beautiful. To me, this is a wall of your culture as a black man from Jersey coming down to D.C. Mm -hmm. That's your survival thrust. It simply means the things about you that keep you, your lineage, your legacy going forward. Mm -hmm. They have one coming in the opposite direction. Yeah. Now, when, because theirs is coming in the opposite direction, there's going to be a clash. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why there's a clash when it comes to an interracial relationship as to why I question, like, how far can you go is because from their perspective, historically, they are not the bad guy. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, historically, you will probably, more than likely, 99% of the time, see them as the opposition and the bad guy. Mm -hmm. There is a clash. Yeah. Because now, in true honesty and transparency, feelings get hurt. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of growth in your relationship to be willing to be honest 
and hurt your partner about certain things in their history that afflicts you without them resisting it and challenging it. Now, resisting and challenge isn't a bad thing. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. But there comes a point where you're resisting and challenge out of ignorance and emotional reaction, not out of facts and history. Yeah. Because to say, and I'm a, so we can move forward, I'll introduce myself here. Mm -hmm. To say this, for example, black people haven't contributed nothing to, this, to the planet. Historically, that's a lie. Yeah. That's a whole lie. Yeah. But then there's a part of you that if you're not black, you're going to go, well, what have y'all contributed? If I was, <laughs> exactly. If I was to say the street light, radiator, mm -hmm. internet, mm -hmm. there's a part of you that's going to go, that's not true. And then we're going to pull out Google and then mm -hmm. you're going to find a way, yeah. whether you realize it or not, subconsciously to debunk what history and I have just said. Mm -hmm. That's where I go. How far are you willing to go? Because to go forward and fight for your people sometimes, mm -hmm. most of the time, requires hurting people on the other side who have a wrong or an skewed view of who you are. You could also approach that conversation with, well, what have you guys stolen? Yes. So now instead of just the explanation, it's now an accusation that they have to handle with the like explanation that. of facts. No, no. I, I like that and I honor that. That's a good way of looking at it because yeah. we are literally living on a continent where an indigenous group of people who were here for billions or hundreds of years are down to like a handful. Mm -hmm. Like literally in, in taking this land, yeah. in, in, in Native Americans are this much in this giant bucket of water it's mm -hmm. like to your point yeah hey, like what is your answer to that most people online will probably just say most white people online will probably say that's a horrible thing it shouldn't happen all these other justifications mm -hmm. as well then there's a but yeah or a hard period yeah then what's what's the restitution yeah well, what here we go what can we do something mm -hmm. ask the native americans what you can do mm -hmm. since it's their land it's the same thing with black people like reparations in my opinion shouldn't be monetary alone because yeah. if it's if, a structure it, it, it comes down to the infrastructure if white people re yeah. if, if white racist people mm -hmm. really wanted to just end this whole conversation they would just pay the monetary money yeah and then hike up just prices throw, throw money at it and yeah. then get the money back and then get that's yeah. exactly that's why I say like it shouldn't just be money mm -hmm. but if they really wanted to they yeah. could squash that whole debate real quick with Okay, no, we gave you, what did you, what, you wanted a million apiece? Mm -hmm. We gave you tax exemptions and money that equal out to a million apiece. How you mismanage your resources is on you. Mm -hmm. I'm about to do a whole round robin and go in the circle. I'm going to stop there and just no, say No, I got this. you, I got is you. That, that's why I say, to me, mm -hmm. I always change, and not change, but I tailor my approach on and off camera. I'm going to say the same thing, mm -hmm. but I tailor, and also because I still teach part-time students, and I don't want university. Education continues. We talked about that. Correct. Yeah. I don't want universities going. Dr. Brian, <laughs> what did you mean by mm. white devils? <laughs> <laughs> Even though I gave a reference just yeah, now, yeah. it's not a Dr. Brian yeah, reference. They, they, they stuck right there. Yeah, they were like, ah. yeah. And you're like, so I did all that explanation for you not to hear it? All of that, and you didn't hear you, none of it. I said, you know I'm what your life should this? be? Uh -huh. Is it State Farm that does the commercials where yeah. they throw the flag and then you like review the play? I don't know if it was them, but I guess it's one of the insurance yeah. companies. You should have that. Like, I didn't say, no, you said that. So, all right, throw the flag, <laughs> get down. See, look, this is what I said. I also explained myself right here. I look, literally look, said, look, not to be insulting. I'm trying to support you. I, I fuck with you now. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I, just, I literally was just, the whole premise was, oh, yeah. let me use an example. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but which camera am I introducing myself to? Uh, this is the main camera. So, that's you okay. right there. So, yeah. just do a general introduction of who um, I am? Sure. Tell them who you are the work that you do and your interest when it comes to mental health. Oh, okay, no. I think that's like a good place to start for you. Okay, all right. Yeah. Hey, everybody, how you doing? It's Dr. B or Dr. Brian. Either way that you want to call me is up to you. He's both. I am both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a doctorate in mental health counseling and counseling education supervision specifically. Um, I own my own private practice with my younger brother. His name is Dr. Lakeith. And my he next... He is next. Actually, I was going to recommend that you. I was going to send him your way because he would love to talk to you about these things. He's big. So mm -hmm. I can say this on camera. Mm -hmm. I went and got my degree and my license as a licensed professional counselor. My degree is in clinical mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. I got my doctorate in counseling, education, and supervision, which is the highest degree you can get 
as a licensed professional counselor. My younger brother is a clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. So he went and got his master's as a clinical social worker and then recently, as of last year, got his doctorate in social work. So where we come together is clinical work in office dealing with mental health. Where we pivot is he in his social worker training is more concerned about community factors and resources that a client can use. Mm -hmm. Me as a counselor, I am more focused on wellness, treatment, therapy, and getting you from point A to point B in whatever fashion you want that to be. So you guys basically are your one side of the coin. He's one side of the other coin. And that kind of allow you guys to talk about what are the problems or pushbacks we're running into with the work that we're doing and how do we solve each other's problems? You would be 100% correct. I will always tell people this. My younger brother, to me, is mm -hmm. the better clinician because he's been doing it longer. Yeah. And he would agree because he's done it a lot longer than me. He Practice. will always practice is the yeah. point he will always tell everybody that i'm the better theorist because of how we're trained mm -hmm. but to your point yeah it allows us two ways of looking at it because if i'm trying to figure out for instance if we're working on a project working on a presentation working on like a panel in order to help the community out mm -hmm. i'll go to him and go what are what would you consider the sociological factors or communal based factors that are impacting x when it comes to like anxiety among black people, mm -hmm. uh, depression among Hispanic people, things like that. Yeah. He'll come from that perspective. Me, I can tell you from a theoretical standpoint and from a, because I have an interest in the neuroscience of what we do as clinicians, I could tell you more from a bottom up approach. Mm -hmm. So literally the basis of anxiety, the basis of depression, the basis of trauma, which areas of the brain is impacting and how it's manifesting in this person and how best to treat said disorder. Mm -hmm. He can tell you from the outside looking in, these are the things that impacted that person and from a therapeutic standpoint, this is how you can deal with it as well. Do you ever get to implement these theories? Because the reason I bring this mm -hmm. up is these interviews are very important because people don't know what therapists do. We have an assumption and a media painting of what a therapist is. A therapist is the updated shrink mm -hmm. for most people. Sure. First time you think of a therapist, you think of somebody sitting in a chair laying down and somebody writing notes. And then that turned into jokes of the notes going from good notes to just, all right, this person's playing like tic tac toe tic -tac against themselves. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And now it's more better help is the face of therapy. It's a company right. that I don't like. Yeah. I don't know your thoughts on I'm it. I'm not a I don't know enough about them, but to you what I was gonna I'm say not was a fan. the little bit I know, I'm yeah. not necessarily liking it because mm -hmm. you're commercializing a personal process. I'm a fan of them getting therapy to a lot of people. I think it's important to have access to therapy. I'm not a fan of the quality of their body of work. Correct. That's why I yeah. so yeah, the commercializing of a personal product or personal process is the issue that I have. I haven't mm -hmm. done a lot of research on better health because I do like like you said, they're yeah. getting therapy out there. Yeah, better help. Better help. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so help, much. Thank you so much. No, I got you. I got yeah, you. That shows you how much I haven't looked into. No, 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 you're yeah. good. You're good. So, yeah. I remember uh what, were you finished? I don't want to... No, the only thing I was going to add to that was uh -huh. I like that they're getting it out there, but I do know some clinicians that work with them. Mm -hmm. And in order to turn a quote-unquote you know, income so you can live in this area that we live in, mm -hmm. they're seeing a whole lot of clients. Mm -hmm. There's a point where you're mismanaging your schedule or you're seeing too many clients or patients to be effective as you could be mm -hmm. if you were to dial it back. You remember that conversation we had earlier in the beginning? Mm. Are you a machine? No, I exactly. Oh, okay. No, I not just... at all. Oh, my. <laughs> hey, when people, Juice, when, when clinicians tell me, when clinicians tell me, like, man, I'm seeing six, seven, eight clients today, mm -hmm. I'm like, now nah, you, how will, is it today or is that usual? When people tell me stuff, when clinicians say stuff to me, like, I see seven clients a day, I immediately think to myself, you, you're approaching burnout. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Mm -hmm. Seven clients a day, five days a week? Yeah. That's 35 hours of work. Now, granted, I always tell people this. People look at it like, okay, well, I do a 40-hour work week. Of course you do. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong. We're conditioned that way. Mm -hmm. But when you're in therapy session, yeah, we're talking for one hour straight. Catching those emotions. Mm -hmm. Catching those painting and those pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm fully engaged with you. For one straight hour. You, on mm -hmm. the other hand, may be in a calm, 
relaxed state, retelling, mm-hmm. saying things, responding to my questions. And to, this goes back to your original point. Do therapists use theory? Yes. Mm-hmm. All therapists use theory. All therapists should be using the theory because theory informs how do I say this properly? Theory lets the therapist know how to look at the problem. All right, give me an right. example. I'll give you an example. Okay. So, for instance, the most famous form of therapy that most people know of is cognitive behavior therapy, mm-hmm. CBT. Yeah, CBT, very popular. Very, very popular, yeah. right? CBT uses what's called the cognitive model. That model, that cognitive model is a framework for how the clinician looks at your issue. And the easiest way to explain that framework is four parts. Your thoughts Mm -hmm. generate a reaction with your emotions, your behavior, and your bodily sensations. Mm -hmm. So using that as the framework, when the clinician is looking at you and he's asking questions or creating scenarios and you're responding, using that framework, he's looking at those four components of who you are. Like what thought is causing the emotion? So an what? example of that would be <clears throat> anger mm-hmm. leading to shortness of breath. Correct. And also a tightened chest mm-hmm. and heat mm-hmm. in your chest because that's where a lot of your blood pools in right. your heart. So your pinky, when you said anger is the emotion, the mm-hmm. next three fingers were a physiological response. Yeah. So then using that same example, like if you were angry, it would then come down to what statement or thought did you say that made you angry because Mm -hmm. even when you're recalling there's going to be a simulation of that emotion Mm -hmm. i can look at you and see like okay your mood changed did you get angry there even if it's it might not be to the same intensity Mm -hmm. as it was in a moment but it's like okay your mood changed what changed your mood right there Mm -hmm. what were you just thinking about yeah that's me using the theory yeah i'm connecting that thought to that anger Mm -hmm. so all clinicians use theory all clinicians should use theory Mm -hmm. that informs how we look at the problem and then it actually helps me Mm -hmm. communicate to you how i'm looking at the problem so that's why all clinicians use theory and that's why theories are important i like how you say all clinicians use theory and all clinicians should should yeah i think all should what you're really saying is we're supposed to use That's theory. exactly what I'm right. We're supposed to. <laughs> but yes. the second part is, I hope to God we use the theory that we learned. I'm praying that we... <laughs> so there's, there comes a... Juice, if I can be honest, there comes a point where yeah. um, I love when I'm teaching students or, I'm, or we're onboarding a, a new clinician to our practice. Mm-hmm. The first question I ask is, what theory do you use in therapy? Okay. The most common one I hear is CBT. Mm-hmm. I, I like CBT. Don't get me wrong. I have nothing against it. But I mm-hmm. always tell people... That's fine if that's like your base, but don't get anchored to it. Because what do you do when a client or a patient comes in and goes, I don't want to do CBT. I did it with my last therapist. I done done the thought logs. I done done the breathing. I want to do something else. Mm -hmm. I hope you got something else. Are you willing to go off script? Correct. Yeah. So not only should they have a base theory, Mm -hmm. they should have several theories to fall back on. To your point, yes clinicians should use theories Mm -hmm. i hope they are but there are times where you don't put the theory aside but you got to be more you in the moment so we're taught to be authentically you in therapy within professional boundaries like for instance but do you know who you are authentically well that's a different question because a lot of clinicians don't realize that especially junior clinicians when they first come into therapy right they're coming in for a noble pursuit but then they realize that in a therapy session they're getting triggered Mm -hmm. and they don't know why yeah like they don't understand why they're getting triggered so they now they avoid certain topics Mm -hmm. that to me goes in line do you know who you are Mm -hmm. because you got to have a level of self-awareness as a clinician to recognize when you're triggered but still be present and mindful in the moment also avoidance isn't a proper boundary I would agree with you. Because avoidance means you're not acknowledging what's going on and you're not writing down, okay, I can handle these topics. I can't handle these topics. And when I'm approached with someone who can't handle these topics, I actually won't have the ability to help them out like I would like to. Right. Yeah. I would say that as a clinician, Mm -hmm. when you're in therapy helping somebody, you should know what triggers you. Hopefully. Hopefully, but there's don't worry. Gonna, there's always going to be a new topic. To be honest with you, you're going to yeah. know. You're, you're going to feel it. You're, okay. There's no way around it. You're gonna, After doing it long enough. Yeah, I honestly tell everybody this. I always mm-hmm. tell other clinicians, it's real hard to do couples counseling when you're going through a breakup in your personal life. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, 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 right. yeah. It's hard to do. Yeah, what? Yeah, it's hard to do. Oh, couples oh, when you go through a breakup. I'm hearing about someone's love. Oh, yeah. I'm hearing about someone's love breaking down. Oh, or, 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 or you an individual oh. session, and that client or patient yeah. is coming to you about a bad relationship. Yeah. It's hard. You're oh. gonna feel that oh. emotional. Oh, reaction. you still have a chance that oh. I don't have anymore. Oh, I don't yeah. like that. Yeah, you're gonna feel it. So it's important for you to know mm-hmm. what your triggers are. Yeah, and work through them for the sake of the client meaning that i encourage all clinicians that they should practice mindfulness exercises Mm -hmm. so that way you learn how to be present you got to learn how to file that trigger away in the moment to help the client and then when you come out do some self-care for yourself what's a mindful practice looks like look like for a therapist who's in the moment of being triggered. Okay, so I'm yeah. actually glad you asked that question because I do this all the time. Okay. A mindfulness practice that I do is this. When I hear something that triggers me, because mm-hmm. I I use mindfulness all the time. I'm a clinician that it's very rare juice that I don't do a technique on myself that I do with a client. Okay. Completely and utterly rare. The only technique that I've learned that I haven't done with, uh, that I haven't done on myself is EMDR. Because mm-hmm. you don't do EMDR on yourself. So you guys say what EMDR so, is. So, uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Okay. It's the, now, now, you're like the seventh person I had on this platform uh-huh. doing it, but because you guys are clinicians, you tend to not explain certain things. Got you. Because you're taught, like, gotcha. hey, just say the letters, they'll figure it out. And it's gotcha. like, no, this is a platform for the average person to not figure it out, but for us to hold their hands and let them know, okay, here's what this is and here's why we use it. No, no I appreciate that. So EMDR right now is the number one research mm-hmm. approach. It's a theory in and of itself, okay. an approach to trauma. What it is basically is this, is that they use bilateral stimulation. Most people know of it as tapping. When people hear EMDR, they think about the tapping thing. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens is when we do this bilateral stimulation, we have you go into your memory banks mm-hmm. and you reaccess memory that provoke a strong emotional reaction Mm -hmm. usually is trauma you can use EMDR for a multitude of things trauma anxiety whatever it may be but when you're going into that process of tapping bilateral stimulation Mm -hmm. and you reactivate that memory what's going on is this you're reactivating the neurological pathway the pathway in your brain to that memory that's been kind of cut off a little bit from you avoiding it Mm -hmm. that you've been doing your entire life and then in the process of it what's going on is this as we're tapping we're letting your body and to many degrees your mind know that this is a safe space to run the memory through its process Mm -hmm. in that process as well we take where you are and how you want to think about that memory and then we infuse the two as the EMDR process goes Mm -hmm. so what it is is that you bring up the memory do the tapping Mm -hmm. we ask you questions you go back in tap some more pull up some more information then we take what you want to think about that memory right Mm -hmm. how you want that memory to be and you go back in tap and you fuse it together that's why a lot of times when people come out of EMDR they say I feel lighter I feel really really good Mm -hmm. that's because what's going on is we're taking the memory we're letting it run its process because traumatic memories have this thing where you have the episodic part the part that you can visualize like me and you talking right now it's like a video the video recording Mm -hmm. the pictures that you can see then you have the emotional part to it well when we have a good experience bad experience neutral experience the two infuse and they go into our memory banks Mm -hmm. well when you have a traumatic or very stressful situation they fracture and they get encoded improperly that's why some people are able to visually recall the trauma Mm -hmm. but they don't feel anything Mm -hmm. or some people are able to remember the emotional experience of the trauma but they struggle with recalling what happened is that what leads to people self-editing memories to make a better version of whatever the traumatic experience may have been? That sounds more like, so you have repression and suppression. Repression Mm -hmm. is where you don't remember it because it was just that shocking to the system. Yeah. Suppression is you trying to force it out of your memory Mm -hmm. intentionally, right? Yeah. That sounds more like that because the more you try to force it out of your memory, the more you don't get an accurate recall. Mm -hmm. So when you don't get an accurate recall, your mind, regardless of whether you're suppressing it or not, it'll do this thing where it fills in the gap to match a theme and a narrative you've given it. That's why memory is such a, I mean this with, and backed by research and I'll explain why. Memory recall is very, very inaccurate. Okay. We learn it from the neuroscience of it all. Like mm-hmm. for instance, when we ask you to activate a memory, when we connect you to the machines, the fMRI machines or whatever, what have you, it'll be one pathway 
Mm -hmm. and you'll come back the next day we actually recall it it'll be a similar but not quite the same pathway okay so from that we've learned that memory call is inaccurate but what happens is this when it comes to memory call there's an overall theme mm -hmm. overall narrative mm -hmm. and overall emotion that's attached to it so yeah memory call in and of itself is tricky so what will happen is based upon that theme narrative and emotional attachment to it, whatever mm -hmm. emotion that you're giving it yep. your mind and brain will fill in the gaps why is it important to be mindful as a therapist when it comes to your clients and their real life stories? So the reason why it's important to be mindful, and I'm, and I really do appreciate you reminding me to explain to everybody. When mm -hmm. I say mindful in this context, I mean present. Okay. The reason why it's important to be present is so that way you're not missing key information. As a clinician, right, there are two ways to do um, therapy. There's a, a directive and non-directive approach. Mm -hmm. Directive means. I'm going to give an example. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is a very directive approach where I come in with a set agenda, where we create an agenda together, and we hit those points on the agenda. I go over it. I teach you a technique. Mm -hmm. We process. I do a summary. You go home. Right? Yeah. There's still some you talking about what's on your heart because we create the agenda in that process in the beginning. What would you like to discuss? We stick mm -hmm. to the agenda. I give you the techniques. You go forth and be great. Then you have a non-directive approach, which is more like person-centered approach where you come in and I go okay so how has your week been what's been on your heart what would you like to discuss and it kind of free flows from there right mm -hmm. I just wanted to lay that down as the foundation so the reason why mindfulness is very very important as a clinician or being present in the moment is this when you're present in the moment yeah you get to get that information whether it's directive or non-directive both theories whether you're directed or non-directive requires you to kind of get out of your boat mm -hmm. and get into their water and wade through their water with them, their experiences with them. It's real difficult to wade through the water with them when you're constantly getting triggered and mm -hmm. you're thinking about, man, when they said that, it made me think of this. It made me think of that. Is that me? Am I that? Now you done stopped wading in the water and they're mm -hmm. 10 yards, 20 yards ahead of you. Yeah. Now you're snapping too, like, okay, what did I miss? So therefore, it's important to be present because they need you in that moment mm -hmm. while they're wading through the water to point out the things that they may not be picking up, whether it's a direct approach or a non-direct or indirect approach. That's why it's important for you to be present. You're doing a great job. I just want to let you know. Hey, I appreciate yeah, that. No, no problem. No problem. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> that. But it, that, that part is it's important because <clears throat> people often think that therapists don't have issues. They do. Everybody, you're a person. Oh, absolutely. As, as a person, inherently, something's happening. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. I understand that, from my experience, has been this. Mm -hmm. Therapy is a few occupations out there where people go, you don't got anything going wrong. Like, for instance, a spiritual leader like a pastor. People probably look at their pastors and go, I mean, you know, you probably got it all figured out. They look mm -hmm. at their therapists the same way. You probably got it all figured out. Not at all. Therapists can get triggered by your story mm -hmm. in session just as easily as anybody else can. So anytime someone says you don't have anything going on, and I've been met with that before, mm -hmm. what I find that's code for is you don't have anything that's bothering the people around you or getting in the way of things you'd like to do. Mm. Elaborate. That's on. what that is. So when you <coughs> think of you don't have anything going on, and this isn't just a health perspective, it's just a life in general, you usually think, hey, how many opportunities have I squandered, mm -hmm. right? So life is a measure of, if you're this kind of person, did I maximize the opportunities that I had? Or if you're the other kind of person, it's, did I do better than what I'm compared to in general, mm -hmm. right? So there was this one time I had a talk with a couple of folks and we were talking about siblings. Now. I'm the younger brother from my sister, the older brother from my other sister, right? But we were all raised in different houses. Mm -hmm. So my conditioning and my standard is you're the first kid to that household. So it's your responsibility to do your best because you who are who I've raised, right? Mm -hmm. So most people would be like, well, you're the middle child. No, in that household, you're the first child. Correct. So even if my dad had a uh, sister, Tamara, older than me, or a younger sister, Kimon, younger than me, and another sister, Nicole, where I was twins. Is that four? It's four. Okay. Right. But all different houses. Right. You're still the first, first kid. Child in that so house. your standard is 
when you fail, everybody fails. Oh. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So when folks say, like what you've said before, mm-hmm. what I'm using as the example, it's, well, look at what you have. You have a great house. You have art. You have the ability to do these mm-hmm. interviews. You're obviously able to afford the equipment. But the other side of that is, well, do I have the ideal job that keeps my mom from questioning what I'm doing for myself mm-hmm. or with myself to make enough money for parents to stop asking what's going on in your life? Mm-hmm. No. But when you have it all put together, and most people will be like, oh, that's a parent thing. It's like, nah, but your parents' voices exist in your head when yes. they're not around. <laughs> so it's like, do you have a capacity to battle those voices in person? Or battle them when the people aren't there and have a real conversation with, well, how do you feel about what's going on in your life and where you are? Because you're always going to be the best measure of what you need to do. Or my partner has uh, a couple chronic illnesses, right? So in my head, it's, hey, man, are we making enough money in case an emergency happens? Because with someone with chronic pain, the emergencies aren't scheduled. They pop up like, hey, what's up, baby? I'm right on time. Yeah. What you doing, man? Me ER visits that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. You like that emergency <laughs> room, man? You about to see a lot more of that, baby. <laughs> you get oh, what I'm yeah, saying? I get what you're doing. Your, ER <laughs> Your insurance company's like, hey, look. Yeah. The first two is on us. Yeah. Oh, you got a savings? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, you collect enough money? Okay. And you got a good side hustle? Oh, okay. Oh, you got time to do these interviews? Oh, okay. And it's like, you know, you got to measure those things as you go. Yeah. So, no, 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 go no, ahead. no, no you, you're about to say something. No, all I, I was felt the gem was, coming. Yeah. yeah. What I was going to say was, and that's the, the part of mm-hmm. when people are struggling that people don't see. Yeah. They, we, at least in this culture, in the American culture, mm-hmm. we judge your success by material gain. We're viewed as Western, right? Yes, Western, Western values. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, like, people will look at everything you have, your career, mm-hmm. and be like, oh, yeah, you got it figured out, but they don't know. The burden that you carry Mm -hmm. they don't know the weight of being able to hold up said perceived success Mm -hmm. and as we were saying it it made me think of something that I I had talked to a client about because it made me think about something for the black community she had asked me a question um, and I shared it with her and I don't know if it's in line with what we're talking about now but I do want to share it now Mm -hmm. because she was like her friend was trying to do something for you know to grow black people and it was a quote that I created in the moment that I, I, I now have and I carry it with me mm-hmm. is that my biggest concern for us yeah. as black people is that we won't pay for the things or we won't invest in the things that grow us, mm-hmm. but we will pay and invest in the things that show we grown. Nice car, big house, mm-hmm. great lawn. Yeah. But, but you won't. For instance, Uh we were talking about this before. Mental health is a hot topic, but there are people out there that still won't seek it out. Mm -hmm. You won't invest in that or a course that will help you to learn mindfulness. Mm -hmm. You won't invest in that. Mm -hmm. The things that will grow you as a person, we don't necessarily invest in. And I see it all the time, Mm -hmm. but we will invest in the material things that symbolize success. A G-Wagon truck. A Land Rover car, which mm-hmm. is a horrendous product, by the way. A lot of gas. Gas yeah, guzzlers. You just stayed two gas crazy. guzzlers. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. A Land Rover yeah. is just, I'm not, crazy. I'm not subscribing to that. Yeah, it's but not even a good, comfortable interior either. Yeah, the older ones are way better than and what they And they have out a now. reputation of falling apart. Yeah, but unfortunately. people will buy those things, mm-hmm. but not invest in the things that will grow them. Mm-hmm. And I guess this is how I could tie it in. It's one of those things, like you said, like, can you deal with the voices when they're in person and then when you're not around? Because I always tell people in therapy, one of the benefits of therapy is this, and we saw it in the pandemic, is that the thing that you're using your job, happy hour and friends to run away from, Mm -hmm. gets louder at night when you're trying to sleep because all those distractions are forced out. Now you're stuck with those voices, Mm -hmm. the voices of how you view yourself as a as a result of how your parents raise you mm-hmm. how you view yourself as a part of how your partner speaks to you how your children identify you mm-hmm. can you deal with those voices and one way of dealing with those voices is the investments that you make in yourself to grow so that's actually ironic you said that this uh you know i work over at uh all 14th run establishment players mm-hmm. club do a great job security all this other stuff right okay. 
really good. See that, really good at diffusing I stuff. That. <laughs> I was going to ask that. that you play football at any point in your life. Yeah, no, I did pro tryouts for like yep. five, six years. What position? Uh, D tackle. Yep. 2012 to about 2017. Then everything went downhill and came back uphill because ebbs and flows in life. Mm-hmm. But um, what was I about to say? This young man approached me right at the bar mm-hmm. last weekend. I was like, hey, what's up, man? He was on a date. He's like, hey, what's up, Juice? I'm like, I'm good. How you been? He's like, I'm trying to get like you. I said, what you mean, man? He said, you know, that IT stuff, the architecture. I'm trying to get like you because I do cloud architecture, right? And I was like, when he said that, he was on a date, but like I was bothered by him wanting to get like me but not following up later in the night to get my number so we could talk about what he would need to do to get in a cloud architecture or knowing the resources that I have or the people that I network with or the companies that may be a good fit for him starting wise or the folks he may need to align himself with and learn from in the meantime. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I'm at work, I'm I'm very keyed in. Like right now, when we do an interview, you ain't see no cell phone, no reading the questions, mm-hmm. no nothing. It's just the flow of the conversation. So when stuff like that happens, it's like, are you really trying to get like me or is that just a really good topic for us to mutually be on the same page about while you're on a date and then you go home and you don't get to take the step forward that you was trying to get like me for, which I think is more important. Like whatever you say, I don't really matter in people's lives. I'm only wherever people think I am in their life, which obviously I've earned from being nice Mm -hmm. and doing what it is that I do. That was my notification for another interview, but they'll hit me up when they come. Mm -hmm. But I do take it very personal if I find out you tell me you have this dream or something you're really interested in and you're not doing what you need to do to get there. But when you see me, it's important. That dream or that goal or that directive should be even it should be feverishly important when I'm not in the room. And when I see you, it should just either be updates or topics on here's what I'm working on. Here's what I'm running into. Do you have advice about that or have you been here before? Are we having the same problem? Mm. Because progress Failure is progress's best friend. Right. You know what I'm saying? You need to fail. You need to do bad. You need to know what you're doing good at, so you don't need to focus on that, but you do need to still sharpen that knife when you're not using it. I wish more people knew that failure and success go hand in hand. There's no yeah. failure and progress, as you say, go hand in hand. There's yeah. They're no way, yeah, yeah. There's no way around it. And mm-hmm. there's two points that I wanted to say to what you had said. What's up? But with that, mm-hmm. yes, I deal with a lot of clients when they're worried. I'm the same way also. I'm not an exception to the thing that I'm saying, but when I see that in other people, that always flares up like, no, we could do better. (laughs) Yeah, I I would like to encourage everybody to know that Mm -hmm. that the 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 narrative you hear about don't wait for the perfect time, just do. Yeah, so true. I have sat across from so many people and helped them on their journey Mm -hmm. to where they're worried about failing. To me, right? Because I, as a aside from being a clinician, I'm an entrepreneur. Me and my brother have our own private practice, mm-hmm. which means you run a business. We run a business, mm-hmm. and I, in particular, am responsible for the business side of it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm the one that does the majority of the business side. My brother is more mm-hmm. of the clinical director because, and I appreciate him because when we got into business together, he said, "I hate business. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it." And I told him I appreciate your honesty because that lets me know I need to go train and prepare myself mm-hmm. to do it. So, so I could be good. Or so okay it could be good, at great, and mm-hmm. grow. So yeah, but okay. so I can be good at business. Oh, so you got three G's. Yeah. Good, great, 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 grow. Okay, grow. Yeah. All right, cool. I see you. So yeah, that's that's important. Uh-huh. But here's the thing: progress, as you said, is a process of trial and error. Mm-hmm. We've failed at certain things, yeah. but the thing is, we come together, we looked at how we failed, and we just go, all right, well, let's clean it off and just keep trying mm-hmm. that part's important so success is not absent yeah failure it's not gonna happen progress is not absent failure failure i like how you said it they're gemini's they're opposite sides of the same coin mm-hmm. to the two things that i wanted to say the first one was obsession and the other thing is uh being taught those yeah. are my reminders as i go yeah. obsession to what your point is this if you really wanted to be where you were i always ask people is like what is your gift and your purpose mm-hmm. because i am obsessed with psychology and mental health. As I told you before we came on camera, like I want to apply, I'm going to apply, I'm currently mm-hmm. applying to go back to get a PsyD in psychology so mm-hmm. that way I can get 
what I feel is a missing piece of education to open myself up to more people that need mm -hmm. help. I'm that obsessed because I told my daughter mm -hmm. maybe five years ago, I told her, I said, I promise you before I leave this planet, my grandkids are going to read about how great of a psychologist their dad was or a mental health therapist their granddad was. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. So there comes a level of knowing your purpose and your gift. Your purpose is the thing that puts you on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that God put you here to solve. Your purpose is always something for other people. Yeah. Your gift is the thing you give to other people. That's your talent. Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they don't. I find that more people become obsessed with their purpose, but not necessarily their talent. So I use that in your story to say this. I agree with you. If you aren't passionate about your purpose mm -hmm. it's going to show yeah because that might not be his purpose he might like what you represent with that purpose and talent you have mm -hmm. like man i'm trying to be like you i, I want to be good i want to have money i want to be able to afford things mm -hmm. that ain't what he here for yeah nor is it necessarily his talent that's why he's not obsessed to come look for you so i hey. i wanted to say that to people to know identify your purpose and your mm -hmm. gift or your talent and i always say this you don't have to agree with it, but I tell people this. You should focus on developing your gift and your talent to generate the revenue so that way you can live your purpose. Because mm -hmm. your purpose might not be able to generate you sustainable revenue, and that's mm -hmm. okay. But the issue is, is that bills don't run on hopes and dreams and prayers. They don't. They don't. Your they talent don't. and your gift is the area you should spend a lot of time mastering and maximizing mm -hmm. to create some form of stability so you can do your purpose. That was the first thing I wanted to say. But okay. what, were you, what were you No, doing? no, no, no. I want to hear the second. The second thing, thing I was saying about teaching is Yeah. I like your passion about I don't like when people don't follow up with me. Juice, I agree with you. And I think that from my experience, I've learned that I don't think our people are taught how to do that sometimes. Even what we did with uh, the therapist meetup. Yes. This is an example of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm very keen on <laughs> I bring a different product to the mental health space compared to what pro what therapists bring to the mental health space. Mm -hmm. Therapists do therapy. They see clients. They do interviews with clients and they sit down and they go over the redundancy they pick apart the stories they figure out where it starts and stops for the person hopefully and what good advice that person needs to hear to apply to themselves mm -hmm. and then after that it's the person's work ethic correct you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. plus tools mm -hmm. and a tool is only as good as the person that's using it which means you got practice the tool for me I create the space for the stories to be told of that process, which mm -hmm. a lot of you don't have the space to do. Mm -hmm. Even other therapists that are currently running a lot of mental health podcasts mm -hmm. or a lot of platforms to do speaking engagements, a speaking engagement is two hours out of one month if you do one speaking engagement a month, which means you're giving people two hours more than they had before. A podcast, I could shoot 10 episodes and release four episodes in a week. And that's now four hours of different therapists talking that people can follow to get updates on their content if they're making content. So even what I did, when we all played Uno, that was on purpose. I was like, I'm going to play Uno and I'm going to have everybody come to the desk. We're going to play Uno because black people love Uno, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when everybody switched Uno on, they space. said, how long? It, I just learned Spades a couple years ago. I'm that, Jamaican. I no, got that excuse. No, Domino's that, is our thing. I always blame when black people don't know Spades. I uh -huh. never blame the person. I blame their family. <laughs> Like, As I said, hey, hey, black, black, Jamaican, Dominoes. Hey. We on Dominoes. So then that saying? makes so there's that yeah, cultural difference because Dominoes. Dominoes might yeah. be bigger. And, and uh, my family Jamaican was community. always big on don't gamble. Oh, yeah. We have a no gambling clause in my family. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't gamble. My mom plays, like, the tickets yeah. and stuff. And I found out how many tickets she's done over the years of her life. And I'm like, you do realize that's gambling, right? When you're doing the scratch offs, you're not winning, but you're still spending and the money, you know. But she's earned her money, and she has the right to do whatever the hell she wants to do with her money. So yeah, I got to know to stand back and like, hey, let the person play out, man. They'll figure it out. And if they don't, they enjoy themselves, which is very important to the process. Mm -hmm. But in knowing what I bring to the space, when we had our conversations and I exchanged numbers with everybody, I only ended up following up with everyone that said sent me a text message or made a call or they were the fewer in the room. Mm -hmm. So that was you. That was Dr. Jones. I'm going to have an interview with her on Saturday. But uh, to 
Are we still going? Oh, no, we're still going. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one failure ain't stopping the whole thing. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. But what I was going to say was um, to the to you, to the example you gave, mm -hmm. I don't think. Sorry about that. I don't Coffee. think. Let me turn around. <laughs> yeah. To what you to the example that you gave, what I was going to say was this: mm -hmm. is that I don't think we're taught how to follow up because I run into a lot of clinicians, right? There's a fear. I, there's definitely a fear. There's a hundred percent. I'm going to give my example of how that fear has manifested. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember when I was there, I made myself available to people because a lot of people wanted Quickly. my information because it's yeah. very rare to find a male therapist, mm -hmm. a male doctor that has their own private practice, right? They can handle that. Right. I told so, my partner about that when I got yeah. home. I was like, that's not a life that I would want to be Man. being the star of the show because you exist and you mm. decided to do the thing. And then the conversation we had about men who don't really want to make a difference mm -hmm. in this space that are more like, hey, man, I'm just trying to be a professional. Get me a quick check, you know, keep it pushed. Oh, yeah. That's real. But yeah. it's like, fam, you went into a profession that had a profession that has few of you. So you technically inherit the mission of you are a man in that space that Absolutely. is needed. Yeah. Whether you want to or not. And when you get advanced education as mm -hmm. well. So to me. Um, and I'm going to go back to the point. When I say advanced education, I'm not talking about your doctorate. When you get licensed as a master clinician, that's mm -hmm. an advanced education to me. Yeah. People underestimate that when you are, in, to your point about you went into this field, mm -hmm. there's a responsibility that comes with it is what I say. Yeah. When you get a master's degree and you're a licensed therapist, that's an advanced education. So when you talk, people will listen. Mm -hmm. So when you enter in a room and there's no one else as a therapist, the room wants a handful of you and they're looking for a mental health perspective, you are the expert. Mm -hmm. So there's a responsibility that you inherited by doing. Yeah. It's even greater when you get a doctorate. And the reason why I say it's greater is because there's a pro and a con to it mm -hmm. or a benefit to it, I should say, not necessarily a con. The benefit of it is this. This has been my experience that when I got my doctorate and I'm about to speak, people will listen. Mm -hmm. There's the responsibility on me to make sure that what I'm about to say yeah. is wisdom, useful or helps. Mm -hmm. Now we just, you know, cutting it up. Yeah. That don't really matter, yeah, right? You can do that any day. Any day. Yeah. However, but coming into this field, mm -hmm. when you into this field, whether you're a man, woman, non-binary, whatever race you are, mm -hmm. you took to your point what you're saying, that responsibility. Yeah. There's no way you're gonna come into this profession. I'm only speaking from a black uh, heterosexual male perspective. There's no way you coming into this profession as a man, especially a black man. Mm -hmm. As a man. Yeah, as a man, period, because mm -hmm. this field is dominated by women. Yeah. There's no way you're coming into this profession and people aren't going to get your information. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. It's just, it's just not happening. I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it. So to the other point, when I say that I feel like we're not talking to your point, you said fear. This is how it's manifested in me. Mm -hmm. I make myself available to people. Because yeah. every time I tell them I own my own practice or I see teenagers, like, I want your information to talk to you. Especially when I say I'm my own practice, I, I want to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I say, here's my card. What you just thought, you're thinking right now. All right. You're the fourth therapist I've interviewed who has a private practice. Mm -hmm. And having a private practice is, hey, man, are you on YouTube watching business videos? Are you asking me? No, no, no. Okay. That's that's what I usually think with mm -hmm. folks. When it's like, hey, when you start a business, the only reason I started a business is my partner in my last relationship. I started a production company because I wanted us to run an business where we interview people mm -hmm. so the reason this platform pays homage to her is because we were supposed to do the work i'm doing now together but it was supposed to be about mental health it was actually going to be interviewing djs that travel and tour and the business of touring and how important that is to the entertainment economy because i believe djs are the lifeblood of parties and events and a good time you know, do people like playlists? Yeah. But when you see somebody on the ones and twos, you now have an expectation of, oh, this is supposed to be lit. Mm -hmm. It just raises the value of whatever is going on in front of you. Okay, I know you feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Like when you walk into an event, you see somebody on the ones and twos, your your mind says they are on the ones and twos. Mm -hmm. Not there's a playlist, not, oh man, who whose jam is that? Let me get my Shazam out. Now I'm going to take a drink and I hope this next transition is worth it or I'm out. Yeah, cause, <laughs> yeah, cause if there are two, I met with a chef one time, sat mm -hmm. down and talked to him. He gave me some insight. So there's two things that I realized now after talking to you about that. There are two things that are make and break the party. Mm -hmm. The music. 
Yeah. So the DJ is responsible for the whole vibe. Mm-hmm. That transition better be smooth to something that's going to go ahead and get us moving. Mm-hmm. And the food. Yeah. If the food is good, whether the event is terrible, according to the chef that I spoke to, he said, they ain't going to care. They probably just come right back next year for the uh, crab cakes mm-hmm. or the catfish. Mm-hmm. But if the music is good, too, and it's a whole vibe, yeah. they'll come back whether the presentation is uh, off. So you're right. I ain't think of it They'll return. Yeah. So because of that, I usually think of before getting a business, getting an <laughs> LLC, making a purchase, hiring a lawyer, do you know what your product is? And yes. even if you don't know what your product is, do you know how to practice your product until it gets better and better? I tell other clinicians that all the time. I yeah. say that they want the product in and of itself. You'll think that it's therapy. Mm-hmm. Now they 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 here for that. Yeah. They just want to know if they want it from you. you. Yeah. You are the product. Mm-hmm. It's you. The theory is a framework. Yeah. The basic counseling skills are framework. Mm-hmm. Therapy. Don't ever get mistaken. Therapy is a service. Mm-hmm. Now you got to define that. Right. So okay. as a service, what it is is this: is that I, a more simple, a simplistic definition is this: I am offering you an open space to heal whatever you bring that needs to be reconciled. Mm-hmm. Whether I want you realize you. you brought it or not. Whether you realize you brought it or not, mm-hmm. and the other part of it is this is so important, I want it to look the way you want it to look. Mm-hmm. Not that how Dr. B wants it to look. That's irrelevant. Yeah. How I want it to look, no, that's not it. I look at it as this way. It's, it's a journey where we're in a car. Mm-hmm. And what it is is you're in the driver's seat, I'm in the passenger seat holding the map. I just need you to tell me where you want to go mm-hmm. and what route like what you want to take the scenic route you want to take the straight route and I will go ahead and, and chart that destination and I will get us there yeah. that is the service the product is the therapist mm-hmm. because they want to buy the service they yeah. just want to know if they want to buy it from you yeah. it's like literally yeah. like a cell phone yeah. I need a cell phone yeah. uh, just T-Mobile, Verizon you got something. Hey, you I, got I, need, I need to know which provider yeah. I'm getting it from it's a cell phone store uh, who cool. got the better commercial correct you know okay. That, and a lot, I wish a lot of clinicians to know that. So, going back to the to the point I was going to make, and I wanted to finish you, let you finish your thought about what you was going to say about business, mm-hmm. was that a lot of clinicians are coming to me and they'll go, "I want to learn how to start my own business." I'm like, "Sure, that's not a problem. Here's my information," and they don't follow up. And sometimes, for some, I'll follow up with them. Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Yeah, well, you know, when you want to meet." Yeah. And I'll, I'll sit them down. I'll walk them through it. Long story short, when I say that I feel like people aren't taught, I've bumped into certain clinicians. I'm like, you never followed up about starting your own practice. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, I've had one clinician honestly say to me, she said, look, I was worried. I was nervous. I know you're busy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I could do it. And I didn't want to seem thirsty. Not in the sense of trying to get with Doc B, but thirsty in the sense of like Mm -hmm. bothering me about starting it. I'm like, no, you got to dispel those thoughts. Yeah. You never, you're never gonna get there until you start. Talk to yourself out yeah. of it. And I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. That's when I say I don't think we're taught because we talk ourselves out of greatness mm-hmm. so fast, but we'll talk ourselves into like the worst case scenario even faster. Yeah. It blows my mind because I'm like, maybe I need to change my approach. And then I realize it's not a me thing. No. It's that fear of talking yourself out of it. Yeah. Like. When this person said, I just didn't want to seem thirsty and bother you because I know you got a lot going on. Who told you that? What's wrong with being thirsty? Yeah, but the, but yeah. you listen to that. I never said that to mm-hmm. you. You said it to yourself. Yeah. You talked yourself out of the opportunity. Or whose voice do you hear in the background mm-hmm. in your quiet time that's telling you not to do that because of that? Right. I agree. Um, and one more thing, just to something you said earlier. What's up? Um, is, I'll make it quick. Uh, this is why I appreciate how me and my brother balance each other, right? Mm-hmm. Because you, that's what it was. You said earlier, some men will come into therapy and they just here to get a check and everything else. Mm-hmm. I always tell uh, everybody this is that um, when they're trying to find a therapist that has their own private practice, I always tell people, give them grace because they're not trained to be business people. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, a lot of my peers don't answer their emails or their phone call because mm-hmm. it's stressful, right? Yeah. Um, the reason why I say I like having my brother there to balance me is because when you learn the business side of things, right? Like not just looking at YouTube, reading books, taking mm-hmm. some seminars, mm-hmm. taking some virtual courses, implementation, implementation yeah. the importance of systems, funnels, landing pages, mm-hmm. all that nomenclature means something, right? Yeah. It's real simple to let the big green machine 
pull you away mm -hmm. from what you're supposed to be doing as a clinician. Yeah. My brother anchors me back in sometimes mm -hmm. because with him not wanting to do the business, it gives him an unfiltered view. Mm -hmm. Me doing the business, I'm always like, mm, well, we have to think about revenue, operating expense, overhead, how to cut operating expenses, payroll. I just wanted to put that out there because you said something that's important. A lot of clinicians get into this field, from mm -hmm. my experience, to tie it all together, and they get out because they don't have a balanced business mind. Mm -hmm. A lot of clinicians are just like other human beings. They want to make money. They want to be able to, to afford to live in these places, mm -hmm. but then they find that one, it's too stressful to do it on your own sometimes, but it's not. It's hard, but it ain't. It's doable. It's hard. Or you go work for someone else, and you're not quite making enough. So that's yeah. why a lot of men kind of pivot into pure academia, in my mm -hmm. experience. They go off and be the college professors. Now, I have an example of someone who's done that, but they have a valid reason. Personal conversation I just had with my boy Trey out in VA. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's a college professor. And I told him the convo that you and I had and I felt him get tight and attempt to explain himself. And I said, you don't count as the topic I'm talking about. Yeah. He's like, what you mean? I said, we've done street level stuff. You mm -hmm. started with suicide prevention as a therapist before you did work with me. You did work with Get Home Safe. You owned your own private practice. You got an opportunity to be a college professor. You let your clients go so you can apply yourself full time to the next generation right. that's coming up. You want to give them the experience of what it's like to be a real life therapist and have the students realize, hey, what you're taught in class, you're going to have to learn 40% more that's not taught in a class uh, of more being than that, a real opinion. therapist. Uh, no, I get that. I'm just shooting uh, numbers, right? But you're taking care of the next generation. And the reason you want to be a doctor is because you want to change the policies so the things you're teaching your students, they're able to execute with no issue. And that's how policies get in the way. But I was like, everything you've done has a purpose and has a cause and effect, not just a check. So you don't count towards that quality of therapist because everything's quality. Mm -hmm. It's just, is it the quality you need or is it the quality that's in the way right now? Right. So that's usually how I view things. Hey, like uh, even when it comes to going to therapy, I tell people going to therapy is the exact same as when you get married. You know, when folks get married and they would be driving in the car and when they're driving in a car, they got the cans on the back of the car mm -hmm. and it's clanking, clanking, clanking. And yeah, everyone's yeah, like, yeah. oh man, we're so excited for what happens. It's just like that because after you get out of the car and the excitement's done and you start putting the chairs together in the house, you start getting the curtains up, you start noticing that the kitchen isn't really working all that well on the stove and you got to get the boiler replaced and mm -hmm. the car that you actually drove from the wedding is breaking down a year and a half later yeah, yeah, and the yeah. baby won't stop crying and the socks seem to be a little bit more moldy than they used to be. It's therapy. Mode. <laughs> no, I, I see nothing. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. One, that's a really good example you gave. If you, as a clinician, in my opinion, choose to pivot, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. Like when we were at that meeting. Oh, you're like, talking about me right now? No, no, not oh, you. Okay, okay. I'm talking about in general. Yeah, right? okay, yeah. all right, cool. cool like cool. for instance, um, when we were at the meeting greet, that one therapist that said, mm -hmm. you know, if you need to take a break, take a break. Yeah. I would say that, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. If you choose to pivot, and go do full-time academia, because even in the example I gave, right, mm -hmm. why is there a pivot? Financial obligations. Yeah. You're looking to generate more revenue. So for any clinician that choose to pivot, that's your choice. That's mm -hmm. fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I would never look down or, or look at you in a negative way. Mm -hmm. There's no but to that. That's a hard period. Mm -hmm. So with that, that's why you don't see a lot of men in therapy, in my opinion, sometimes. like the one Getting you, therapy or men as therapists? As men as therapists, let me say giving that. Giving people yeah. therapy. Giving okay, people therapy. Cool, cool, That's cool. why I think you don't see a lot of men giving therapy as therapists. Because mm -hmm. they'll come in, they'll do it till they're fully licensed, and then they'll pivot to a full-time academic career. Mm -hmm. If that's what you choose to do, that's what you choose to do. I think that's the better decision because... I know what you're choosing to do. Mm -hmm. You're going to give a better quality a, product. A product and versus service. Versus you feel way. you have to do right. this even though you really don't want to. Because right. it starts showing up physically in your habits. And your energy is just a little bit lower when you're at the meetings that you're supposed to be at. But you don't really feel like being there. Yeah, like when you're in yeah. session and you're not really wanting to be there, you, you, it's easier for you to not be present. Like we were talking mm -hmm. earlier and you check out. Yeah. But, you know, if, if, if they want to pivot. That's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. that, but I think that that's why you see that. Like, yeah, you see a lot of male uh, professors, mm -hmm. and you'll wonder, like, well, 
you know, why don't I see a lot of male clinicians? One, we have to do a better job of attracting male clinicians. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do a better job of tracking black people to therapy overall, period. You mean getting people yeah. into therapy or getting people into therapeutic spaces of implementing therapy and becoming therapists and making a, well, I don't want to say making a difference. I feel that word gets overused. I like overused. the clarity, though. No, I like the clarity of what you said. I would say yeah. both. Attracting younger people to want to get into the field mm -hmm. of mental health therapy to be therapists, whether they're social workers, counselors, or psychologists, or even mm -hmm. psychiatrists, yeah. and getting more people to want to come and receive uh, mental health services because yeah. a lot of people what me and you were talking about before was m when people think of mental health they immediately jump to the disorder or illness mm -hmm. and it's so much more broader than that it's literally about your response to things mm -hmm. how you maneuver in an environment what you said earlier your elasticity mm -hmm. how well you move and, and stretch in a situation yeah what we were talking about earlier like as far as like running and starting and running a business your mental health goes into that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How yeah. will you respond to stress? Expectations. Expectations. How yeah. you achieve goals. Yeah. Like create helping clients create goal lists. Falling short it. of your goals. How you navigate falling short. Yeah. How you navigate failure. Yeah. That one example. Handling right there. that reality. That yeah. update. That update's always going to come on time. You don't know the dates, but it's always going to be on time. Yeah. Now, if you schedule when you would like to do a good measure of your business, which a lot of people don't do, I believe you're supposed to sit down every four months and think like, hey, are we doing this correct? This shirt that I'm wearing is my shirt. Get Home Safe made it, right? And I was supposed to come out with like an, assort, an assortment of clothing. Bad Bitches United hoodies, Get mm -hmm. Home Safe hoodies. Uh, I had a couple of um, campaigns that I was working on for this year. And I looked at the economy. So my girl just showed me a TikTok where this guy was like, the price of groceries in 2022, this guy got 21 items and he showed it was like $128, right? 2022. Mm -hmm. Now, 2024, what would cost someone 21 items, $128 is now $475 because mm -hmm. he put those same items in the cart. And that's how much inflation has had things go up. Mm -hmm. And I think about the clothing that I'm selling and I'm like, oh, you can't sell clothes because no one has free money laying around to support people right now. So you'd be better off just giving content, giving value. When the market comes back up, you can execute the ideas or you could put the clothing in the right hands and the right people, putting the clothing on therapists, putting the clothing on folks in the wellness community, putting the clothing on other advocates who you frequent with that you have real relationships with for it to be advertised. And when people ask, hey, where do they get that? That's when people shop with it. The product will move slower but people will be more intentional of feeling that they got a piece of something that's supporting people that they support, which brings more to your brand. And I like that because in that moment, you assess mm -hmm. the barrier. And instead of going the opposite direction, you just pivot the plan. Yeah. Man, that's a part of your growth. That's a part of growing mentally, as I mm -hmm. would say, because you got to learn how to navigate those things. Like, for instance, what we talked about earlier, fear deters people from taking a chance. Yeah. It just does. And I'm not saying that the fear is not real, mm -hmm. but it's more so like, what are you? what is the fear saying to you? Fear is one of the best weapons we ever got as people. Mm -hmm. It's terrible if you haven't handled it or you don't immerse in it or you don't understand where it comes from. But once you understand where your fear comes from, you kind of understand what the next steps need to be. And it's not always about overcoming the fear. Sometimes it's about creating an environment for yourself to say hey if this fear comes true do i have the things i need to handle what's going on yeah i would say that yeah do i have what it takes to handle it mm -hmm. problem solving in that regard yeah. but also analyzing is what your belief is about the fear accurate mm -hmm. because sometimes our thoughts about what's i mean fear is real it's a real emotion but mm -hmm. is it an accurate assessment of what's to come yeah because fear is usually future oriented like mm -hmm. you're worried about what's coming down yeah but how accurate is your assessment because nine times out of ten how many times have you seen people go man i thought that was gonna be a lot harder it was actually real easy yeah the monster you created in your head mm -hmm. was way bigger than that small little molehill that you just stepped over you know anxiety comes from looking too far into the future Absolutely. and depression comes from hanging out way too long in the past that's a it's a rule of thumb we use in mental health anxiety yeah. is worried about a future that hasn't been written and depression's about a past that we can't change yeah it's a good rule of thumb to go by. If you're anxious, then you're worried about the future. Mm -hmm. If you're depressed, you're stuck in the past. Yeah. A past that can't be undone. So then it's trying to navigate how we want it to look moving forward. So where can the people find you? So if anybody's looking for us, honestly, you can go to our website at www. 
for us. That's F O U S therapeutics.org. That's one big word. You can also find us at Forest Therapeutics. I said forest therapeutics, didn't I? You did. I'm trying not to fubu the conversation. I got you. I right? did that last time. <laughs> yeah. So then you can find us at Forest Therapeutic on all social media platforms on Instagram, on social media. We don't have a TikTok yet. Mm-hmm. Or you can find myself, Dr. Brian Sutton. That's mm-hmm. actually my handle on um, social uh, Instagram on mm-hmm. TikTok. It's Professor B. Yeah, you know we're gonna have a lot of conversations. Yeah, man, I told course, you. I was right. like, nah, we gonna talk. Man, a lot. I would love to come. This was like, actually really, really good. Fun. When I, no, I appreciate that. When I had that phone call. I was like, oh, now we're going we gonna to talk. Let's go. All right, I got to make sure to ask the right questions because we're going to talk. <laughs> you know, I don't people, a lot of times I, I hear yeah. when men want to come to therapy, this is you hear more couples counseling. Mm-hmm. But um, there's two things that people are looking, men in particular, are looking for when they come to therapy. They want to know, like, Dr. B, where you grew up at? You, mm-hmm. you one of us, you a real nigga. Or not? Like, I, all the time, Juice, I hear it all the time. That's why I'm quick to be, that's why I put it out there. Me and Keith grew up in Southeast D.C. on the ah. Ridge Road. We did yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I had one client from New York. He was yeah. like, where you grew up at? Yeah. I said, Southeast D.C. On, on Ridge Road in Section 8 housing. Mm-hmm. Right off of Minnesota Avenue. He said, all right. Oh, I just had the, the slow read. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I just had to make sure you was right. one of us. All right. All right, just just check yeah. in. Just check so in. That's the yeah. first thing I hear. The second thing I always hear is, I don't want nobody telling me how I should live my life. And I always tell people, you'd mm-hmm. be surprised. I do the least amount of talking in therapy. Yeah, I do more listening and asking questions. Mm-hmm. It is very rare. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'll never tell nobody what to do. I make recommendations. Mm-hmm. I never give advice. I never tell nobody what to do. Mm-hmm. I make recommendations. Yeah. You can listen to them or not. I promise you my recommendations will be rooted in some sort of evidence and scientific method, mm-hmm. but I'm never going to tell you how to live your life, and I'll never judge your life. I've I've sat with people so many times. I got you. I sat with so many. I sat with so many people. You chilling. You chilling. You good. You good. You good. I got you. I got you. Production things. There we go. Yeah. Light on right there. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. I've sat with so many people in one session. And this is just an example. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna leave this person alone. I don't want to be with them no more. <laughs> then the next session, they yeah. spent the whole weekend locked up together. Oh, no judgment on my part. Like, okay, yeah. so what pivot? Where? Why are we here now? Mm-hmm. They said the right thing. They made you happy. Cool. So then, what do you want this relationship to look like going forward? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm not gonna judge you. I'm not gonna tell you. Yeah, no, you shouldn't do that. I will recommend that this person might not be healthy for your emotional well-being, mm-hmm. or depending on what we're dealing with, your mental well-being, yeah. or both. You yeah. may want to reassess this a little bit because this right here isn't going to, I don't know if it's going to help you. Man, hear me in the back. If you like it, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not good. Hey, you like it, I love it. Like, I don't agree with it, but you got to live your life. Most people who look at the Marvel I know you got a skedaddle, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most people who look at the Marvel movies are uh-huh. going to instinctually think that Tony Stark is the smartest man in the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm. He's not. Yeah, he's not even in the top three. Yeah, it's he advertising. might be number five. For yeah, all I know. but he does a lot yeah. with that number five spot. He does. Yeah. If you look at the movies, you're going to think that he's number one. The mm-hmm. two smartest people. Actually, the, the list is updated now. But uh, for years, it was Reed Richards, Doctor Doom, Hank Pym was number three. Mm-hmm. Hank Pym is number three, but I, I won't get into that. But what I'm saying is this. The reason why the maker is the Reed Richards of an alternate universe because mm-hmm. Marvel was trying to send a statement that if Reed Richard became unhinged, mm-hmm. no one is safe. Yeah. It's, it's, it was to denote, like, the brilliance of Reed Richard. That's why mm-hmm. I, I would... So for, for movie purposes, it would be better to make Tony Stark the maker, as I say that out loud, because they do the cosmetics. He's, yeah, they he's do the established cosmetics. as that. It would do. Yeah. It would do. It would generate more revenue we get, because we get unhinged him actually. Happening. Right. Yeah. It would. It would really. Cha- it would shock your it, the, be the average movie person. It's right. okay to say it's enjoyable. So for me, as someone who grew up yeah. reading comics, yeah. when you saw an unhinged Reed Richards, you was mm-hmm. like. This man is really a problem because we yeah. we know what an unhinged Doctor Doom looks like because mm-hmm. that's Doc that's who I'm waiting on. Mm-hmm. 
I'm a huge Doctor Doom fan. Yeah. You can't tell me nothing about that guy. There's two people. <laughs> so here's here's my top five. Not like top five, but my personal favorite top five. You don't have to do this yeah, on no, camera. I'm you be, don't. I'm be real. It's quick. all right, man. I, I mean, you can edit this out. You can no, I'm gonna keep it, but you don't have so to here, do this. Here's my top five. Just real Marvel. Quick. Yeah. Oh no, I, just in Marvel. This is just Marvel. Okay. All right. Just cool, Marvel. Cool, cool. Uh, Thanos. I, I like comic book Thanos way more than movie Thanos. Anybody who read the comic books, they'll tell you that mm -hmm. comic book Thanos. Boss, mm -hmm. truth. I, I can't stress it. Yeah. Smartest man in the universe, biggest threat that you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. He's wiped out the universe, I think we're at three times, four times already. Mm -hmm. He done wiped it out and restarted it. Second, Dr. Doom. I'm a huge Dr. Doom fan because mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. No one ever just runs up on Latveria when he's there. Yeah. He's one man, and yeah. you know yeah. you're not going to go over there and act yeah. a fool because he's there. That man lobotomized a bunch of versions of himself just because. I bet he did. He, he, took yeah. the, he separated uh, Bruce Banner from the home. That no, that's, that's the living room out there. That's not me. Uh, keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll go uh, that he's that. He's just that. When Iron Man went to go face Doctor Doom, mm -hmm. he couldn't do it on his own. He had to bring the Sentry with him. He yeah. said it himself. He said, "I can't go see him one on one. I need help." Mm -hmm. uh, number two, like I told y'all, there is Black Panther. I've been a Black Panther fan. If you look at my Kindle, I got all the Christopher Priest run. That was mm -hmm. in the early late nineties, mid to late uh, mid to er, sorry mid to late nineties, early two thousand run. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge Black Panther fan. Mm -hmm. I'm just sticking with Marvel. I'm not going to DC. Kill Mom is the comeback player of the year taking Human Torch to be Killmonger. Say that one more time. Killmonger. I like Killmonger. I like I like John. Comeback I like back player of the year taking him from Human Torch oh, to, to Killmonger. Killmonger. Yeah, I like uh, one of Michael the best transitions. Version. One of the best yeah. transitions ever. I think that was a better move for his career. Oh yeah, yeah. His version of Kill. Mm -hmm. So. No this, one could do that. This is the one time I'm going to say this that's, in reverse. That's a staple version. Like yeah. how Deadpool is uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, and how Hugh yeah. Jackman is Wolverine. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the one time I'm going to say it in, in reverse. I, I think this is the only time I ever said it. That was mm -hmm. the only time where I've seen a movie version better than a comic version. Mm. Michael B. Jordan's movie version of Killmonger Swag. is better than the, the comic book. I'm so serious. The it, piercings. Yeah, it was so much body? better. Yeah. Because in, in the comic book, they, I think they tried to allude to it in the movie, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. In the comic book, most people don't know this, Killmonger flat out beat T'Challa while T'Challa had the heart-shaped herb. Killmonger mm -hmm. didn't have one. Mm -hmm. He was just that strong. Yeah. In the movie, they had to depower him and make it even. Mm -hmm. In the comic book, Killmonger didn't need yeah, he you. Was just be, about that he was just like, no, was just I'm about just, that I'm, life. I'm here for this. I'm he gonna said, no, no, you keep your things. You so, keep your set. So, yeah. uh, what is it? Where are we at? So, Thanos, mm -hmm. Doctor Doom, mm -hmm. Black Panther... My um, fourth one is um, Daredevil. I love Daredevil. Really? Oh, yeah. So yeah, which yeah. one? What do you mean which one? There's only one, Matt Murdock. No, no, I get that. But you're talking about Netflix or comic book? No, I'm talking about comic Well, I like Netflix. I, I like Netflix series. I'm saying pick one. I think you just got to pick oh, one. So you're not discrediting the other oh, yeah. by comic picking book one. version hands Yeah, down. okay. Comic book okay, version. Okay, I never got into the comic book version, oh, but I heard yeah. it was amazing. No, comic book version yeah. Daredevil. R.I.P. to the Iron Fist. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, R.I.P. Yeah. to the Iron Fist. Um, and yeah. I don't have a fifth they one right They could have done that one better. Yeah, I don't think I have a Who's my fifth one? I don't think I have a fifth one right now. Now, DC, yeah, that's different. Iron Fist, he always felt like he was lost. You talking about in the, in the series? Yeah, the Netflix show. Oh yeah, in the Netflix yeah, show. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. always the lost. comic book yeah. version is way better. The acting was great. Yeah, the just comic not the book version is way better. Part. I will say this: that do I think that comic? Do I think that <clears throat> Iron Fist in the comic books is losing to Daredevil? Not at all. You don't think so? Nah, not really? at all. No, 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 no. Man, was about his life. 